Hey out there, so welcome to the official Kazrog YouTube channel. Uh, this is the first time I've done one of these. Uh, this is just kind of taking some questions you guys have sent me that, uh, you know, over the last few months uh, that I've answered variously in text and various forums and places and social media, but I thought I would kind of capture all this stuff here. And also this kind of serves as an introduction also to my new uh, studio space. I just spent a bunch of time uh, and hard-earned cash uh, you know, repainting myself and uh, assembling this new desk, uh, getting some new guitar stands for uh, now I can accommodate, you know, 10 plus guitars over here, uh, which makes it great for switching around uh, when I need to. So kind of an introduction to my new space, uh, as well as for, for most of you, probably an introduction to me. So anyway, um, thought I'd start things off actually kind of at the uh, at the beginning uh, without belaboring everything too much. A lot of people ask me how I got started, why I make plugins. Basically, uh, you know, I, uh, I come from a music business family. I uh, was, have been around recording studios and things like that uh, most of my life. And I found myself at an early age always fascinated by uh, not only music, but also uh, the way that it's recorded, the, the gear that's used and things like that. And so it all kind of logically led to me getting into that. In fact, my, my first real experience working with music um, as a kid was uh, working actually with MIDI sequencers and things like that on the Commodore Amiga. And then, then when I was 14, I kind of got this bug to start playing guitar. You know, my dad's a guitar player, a uh, fantastic guitarist. And so that was very intimidating to grow up around, which made it so it wasn't uh, very inspiring in a way for me to get started on the guitar because you know, I just felt like such a loser when I first started, but at age 14, I was starting to get into uh, kind of shred metal and things like that, uh, starting from the earliest things like Van Halen and Yngwie Malmsteen and stuff like that, and progressing into later stuff like, you know, Marty Friedman, Jason Becker, all that. And uh, fast forward, you know, uh, during and after college, I st uh, started trying to form bands with friends and uh, none of that really uh, went very well, long story short. but. I started getting into also self-production um, at a pretty pretty early point. Um, even you know by 1995, I was doing four-track recordings and uh, synchronizing that with my drum machine and my MIDI keyboard and my my PC and kind of getting everything put together. And uh, you know my friends all thought I was nuts then. And then the direct to hard disk <laughs> recording thing came out, and then people started asking me for help. And then I realized I really needed to learn what I was doing because I wasn't happy with the sounds I was capturing. So uh, kind of got hip to the fact that many of my favorite records were being produced by the legendary Andy Sneap. And I looked him up online and I discovered in 2004, I, hey, he has a forum and he talks to people and he shares his knowledge. And, you know, so many of us who started out on the Andy Sneap forum in the mid 2000s, have gone on uh, to great success. I feel we really owe our careers uh, to some extent to, to Andy Sneap. Um, all of us have, have mentors, you know, we don't just do this on our own, uh, you know, so I've got to thank not only Andy Sneap, uh, but also uh, another producer I befriended a number of years ago around the same time uh, named Ross Hogarth, uh, who is another, you know, fantastic sort of mentor and uh, has really helped me through uh, you know, sort of my process, not only uh, as a producer engineer and then later plugin developer, but also just uh, in my personal life. You know, he's just a really uh, great person with some fantastic insights about life. So, um, but anyway, uh, going back to 2004, one of the things that I started noticing on the Andy Sneap forum were, was that there were a lot of other like-minded individuals where we were all frustrated about the uh, guitar tones that we were getting direct that, you know, okay, you can mic up a cabinet and get a real amp and do all that stuff, but most of us living in apartments, that's not practical to do most of the time. And the direct tone solutions, the amp modelers and things that were around at that time, uh, you know, were fairly decent, but they were definitely night and day different between those and the real thing. So uh, what somebody, I mean, I forget who the first person was on that forum to start playing around with convolution impulse responses for cabinet simulation and um, it just was amazing to me right away with a few IRs that people were capturing in their bedrooms, uh, myself included. I recorded some of my 
Mesa oversized cab through the power section of my 5150, just with a 57 on the cabinet, just really basic, like in my bedroom. And those IRs, if you turned off the cab sim in you know, the amp modelers of that era, uh, which were hardware outboard amp modelers, uh, like the Pod XT and things like that, turn off the cab sim in there, turn on the IR, and it was like, wow, I can make this sound so much closer to a real amp. What the heck? Uh, you know, why doesn't somebody make a bunch of these and sell it? And so, like many of the good ideas that I've thought of, like, you know, why doesn't somebody do this in a pro studio? Instead of rushing out and just doing that, I sat on the idea lazily for four years thinking somebody else was going to do it and uh, nobody did it. So I was like, well, you know, I was kind of between jobs and had dabbled in a failed extent in starting my own business a couple of other times. But I figured, what the heck, let me just go to a friend's studio and capture some IRs and sell them in a pack. And that was the birth of what became ReCabinet in 2008, which was my first product uh, under the Kazrog banner. And, you know, from, from day one, I, I got so much uh, positivity from that. It was, it was a big success. I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be. I just figured, well, worst case, I made this big pack of IRs that I can use for my own productions. If nobody likes it, if nobody buys it, I'll use it myself, you know, nothing to lose. That ended up really kind of being the thing that jump-started my career, uh, which led then to eventually, uh, you know, I've always had an interest in computers, but uh, learning to program C++, learning to write uh, audio plugins, learning the fundamentals of audio DSP to where I put out my very first plugin, which was an IR loader for ReCabinet um, back in uh, 2011. Um, or no, it was 2010. You know, that was an incredibly difficult learning process, but it was incredibly important to my evolution. Um, and that all led to all the plugins that I've put out since. Um, you know, the, the amp modeling with Thermionic, the uh, mastering and mixing stuff with K-Clip, Valve EQ, and then uh, most recently True Iron. So what I see is kind of that, that, that spark that turned into my plugin company was tapping into that frustration that myself and others uh, like me felt uh, on the Andy Sneap forum of, you know, we're recording in our bedrooms, but we want to get our stuff to sound as close to, you know, Andy Sneap level as possible. And of course, you know, at that time, that was a, that was a ridiculous goal. Even now, uh, you know, there's no magic software out there that's going to, uh, that's going to just turn you into a great producer. You, you still have to know what you're doing. You still have to learn. Um, but, uh, I do think, though, that there's a much shorter distance now between uh, what's possible as a beginning bedroom producer and what's possible as you get more advanced and sort of what's possible in a bedroom studio versus what's possible in a large format studio uh, for producing any kind of music. I think that there's uh, a lot to be said for this being, you know, now the era of self-production. And, you know, when I first started with this, that was still this very nascent thing. It was a thing I think that a lot of people wanted uh, to exist, but that didn't totally. So next question uh, that I've been getting a lot lately. Uh, what's next for True Iron? I just put out an update. Uh, it's version 1.1. It actually adds uh, two additional transformer models just within, you know, a little over a month of release. We've already added double the, uh, the models into the plugin. Also has a few other little enhancements uh, in there. So be sure to download True Iron 1.1 if you haven't done so already. As far as what's next, um, I'd say uh, between now and some point in the winter, I think we're going to add some more models. Uh, it's been really fun and inspiring uh, working with Devin Powers uh, down at his studio. Uh, you know, he's just really got an ear and a knack for uh, analog distortion. And, you know, he's just a, a fantastic guitar player and a fantastic producer in his own right. And so it's been very cool working with him. And uh, yeah, so I'm very excited about the future of, of True Iron. Next question is, uh, what's next for K-Clip? Well, actually right now I'm in the midst of debugging uh, a new version of K-Clip. It'll be uh, K-Clip 3.1. It's a free update. Uh, it's not out yet, but it will be fairly soon. A uh, free update that's going to fix a lot of issues uh, with the initial uh, 3.0 release. Uh, I feel like uh, even though there have been a couple of minor fixes to it, um, as it is a completely new code base, a completely fresh start for K-Clip, I've had some time now to, uh, to really look over all the fine details, really optimize the, um, the audio path and uh, make things work better in 
a variety of new hosts. There's actually a bunch of you know, newer hosts out there. A bunch of companies have either put out new, major new versions of their hosts, or they put out uh, new hosts entirely. And uh, you know, making sure that uh, tr uh, not TrueIron, that KClip rather is uh, stable even during multi-band mode uh, in in some of those uh, instances. Uh, stable in terms of you know, not crackling, not getting dropouts. Um, you know, it's, uh, that's been kind of a challenge uh, as that is, you know, a lot of processing going on uh, to make that happen and at the fidelity that needs to be done. So, but what's next for Kclip is, uh, you know, my hope is it'll be much more uh, streamlined in terms of its behavior. You won't have to mess with the quality as much. Uh, there'll be a few more enhancements in terms of settings and workflow. So. Really excited about that for Kclip. All right, next question is, what's next for Thermionic? Uh, well, you know, it's been now two years since the last major update to Thermionic, and uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, making, you know, 30 amp models uh, over the course of a year was the most massive, crazy undertaking I've ever attempted, and uh, it was very stressful, and I think it led to some tunnel vision. I, I, I split up, uh, as you all probably know, all those AMP models are separate plugins, which at the time made sense to me because I thought it would reduce overhead or make it more modular or let people pick and choose easier, but actually I feel like it's just created kind of a fragmented workflow and um, it's resulted in it being a little bit awkward to use even though I'm very proud of how it sounds. Um, so what I want to do is I want to put it all back together, make it one cohesive plugin of, you know, Thermionic plus Recabinet under kind of one roof, and uh, but make it just much more robust and fast and uh, stable and CPU friendly and efficient uh, than it's ever been before. Uh, with I, I want to try to make the the plugin also visually exciting and not just not just have it sound good. I think I. As I said, I got tunnel vision. I was so focused on getting those AMP models to sound like the hardware that there was no time left over really to think about the user interface. So, you know, I just kind of threw, threw together a quick flat UI and just called it a day. And, um, you know, I look at it now and I sort of cringe, uh, to be honest. But uh, so I want to make it look inspiring. I think when you're in a studio, when you're around gear, uh, we're, we're artists and we. I think want to have that feeling that we are using something special um, and that, that that feeling of using hardware can translate into software uh, it, you know if you if you make it visually exciting um, you know some designers think that the oh that's scalomorphism and that's bad because you're reinforcing you know potentially an obsolete workflow well here's my take on that you know uh, guitar amps and guitars and synthesizers and rack gear and all of these things that we have in our studios that are physical and analog, those are, those are things that exist in the real world. Now we can create reasonable facsimiles or indistinguishable ones in the computer you know, at a given resolution, at a given spec. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that an emulation is not and never will be the real thing. And that as long as we exist as physical beings in the physical world, there will be analog equipment, and there will be uh, sort of analog things that we relate to, and that when we use software, we want to have the software be familiar to us. Uh, we, are, we are visual creatures, and we uh, interpret the world around us that way, I think, first and foremost. Even those of us who are extraordinarily sound-oriented, uh, we're still very visual. And uh, so I think I think that making uh, making software look uh, inspiring is as important as making it sound inspiring, and that's something that you know has taken me some time to sort of learn and accept. Anyway, uh, without too much rambling, yeah, that's what's next for Thermionic is putting it all in one plugin, making it look really cool, and putting in some more inspiring presets where you just you can just kind of go from zero to like finished guitar track much much quicker other question i get a lot is uh how should i best gain stage thermionic now you know one of the things that i did in the r d process of thermionic that i look back now and i feel is a bit of a blind spot is you know i'm an active pickups kind of a guy 
Uh, while I do like and I own a lot of guitars with passive pickups, uh, almost all, not all, but almost all the R&D I did for Thermionic was with active pickup equipped guitars and as a result the calibration is kind of based on um, that, that input level. So um, you'll want to back off the input trim for some passives, oddly, uh, just simply because passive pickups tend to have uh, a bit more noise relative to the signal and you don't want to be cranking that noise. Um, so in general, I'd say to gain stage thermionic, I'd recommend uh, pull up a lead channel on a distorted amp and uh, have the gain set at noon. Then go to your input trim and pull back the input trim or push up the input trim as needed to where halfway up on a lead channel of a high gain amp is truly halfway between clean and fully distorted. Uh, then that way you have you know, the headroom where that, that control the gain control in the front of the amp model uh, makes intuitive sense. Um, other than that, you don't really need to overthink it um, because, again, uh, a, an emulation of an amp is not an amp. There's a lot of things that we can do in digital that aren't bound to the limitations of the physical amps. So one of those things is we have a lot more uh, upfront headroom in front of those amp models than you would in front of an actual tube amp. So you can go clean on a lead channel in Thermionic. You know, it's, it's hard to do that on a lot of amps in real life. Like you, on a, say, a PV5150, that's impossible. <laughs> you can't do clean on the lead channel in real life. But in Thermionic, on that equivalent model, the Psycho A, that's possible. You can do it. And another question I get a lot uh, is, what's my favorite amp model out of Thermionic? I, honestly, um, you know, it's funny to me because uh, I, you know, I'm flattered when people ask me for guitar tone advice. I guess that means that they like the sounds I get uh, because I do get a lot of people trolling me and saying, you know, you've, you know, it's sacrilege that you've put, you know, aftermarket, uh, let me show you, it's sacrilege you've put aftermarket EMGs, you know, in this, uh, in this comparison Horus and things like that. Uh, you know, like I said, I love active pickups, you know, for my primary rhythm guitar tones. Uh, that, that's, that's a key to my sound, uh, EMG85 in the bridge. So my favorite amp model in Thermionic uh, using guitars like this with active pickups would be the Fueled Blue model. Uh, for passives, I actually think that the Fueled Silver works a little better to kind of roll off some of the uh, really ridiculous low end that you can sometimes get uh, out of a passive humbucker. Um, and then for, for single coils, you really don't need to worry as much. I find that passive single coils are, in, in general, just so much more articulate uh, than passive humbuckers that, um, you know, the main thing you've got to manage with, with singles, of course, is getting too much trouble. So what I always recommend is, like, if you're, if you're going for an AC30 type of sound, uh, like the Vocal 30 model in Thermionic, uh, you know, I definitely recommend using the non-top boost model if you're pairing that up uh, with single coil pickups, uh, just because it, otherwise that, that brittle top end is just going to rip your head off. If you go into even uh, a very moderate uh, amount of kind of, say, classic rock kind of gain, uh, it can just be too crazy. So those are my recommendations there. Uh, but yeah, like I said, you know, I'm unabashedly, you know, in the era of, of passive pickups, I'm an active pickups guy. Uh, I don't just love uh, EMGs, I actually, uh, hold on a sec, I actually also, uh, in this one, in this comparison through and through, I have uh, the Devin Townsend uh, Fishman uh, humbucker set, which is absolutely phenomenal. I'd say, in some ways, these are the best humbuckers I've ever used. Um, they, they really just have a clarity and uh, a full range to them that uh, you know that no traditional pickup I've ever tried has. I feel like this is definitely a level of uh, of of new design that, that uh, is special uh, to to what Fishman is doing um, with the way that they construct their pickups. Um, so anyway, those are some of my general musings on guitar tone. You know, it really starts with the guitar and with the pickups. Uh, you know, so when people ask me what my favorite amp models are and they go home to say their passive pickup equipped eight string or something and they take my advice and they go, oh my God, you know, this, this is just way too much low end. Like, why do you want so much bass in your sound? Well, it's, you know, uh, like I said, you know, passive humbuckers tend to be a bit woofier and woolier and you got to manage that. Uh, 
you know, usually with a, an overdrive pedal in front always helps, uh, or an, an emulation thereof, like the vintage driver in, uh, in the Thermionic package uh, I, is definitely a great one for, say, taming a passive loaded eight string or something like that. Uh, it can definitely get you into that uh, kind of m more like Meshuga style territory uh, more quickly if that's what you're looking for. That's it for this round. So uh, if you have any questions, obviously just uh, comment down below. Uh, be sure to hit the subscribe button and I'll see you next time.